Hey everybody, welcome to Woodworking Wisdom. Um, my name is Colin Way and we've got Ben Beddows on cameras today. Um, this is a live one today, we are here. Um, we've been, well we're all doing things at the moment. I've just been to a lovely place, uh, which I'm going to show you all about in a moment actually. Um, but the uh, Woodworking Wisdom um, workshops, or not the workshops, but the technicians, our tutors, all of us, we're all here. Um, um, we could just go in different places. So uh, I know Ben and Jason more about that next week once uh, they've been and experienced it but i've just been to a place called pravia in the uh, region of asturias in northern spain to do a woodworking and carving show up there with craig who you'll remember from a few months back at woodworking wisdom so we've been there together um supporting one of our dealers in spain tony fuster and uh, we go there and demonstrate uh, once a year for them at this big in uh, in pravia wonderful place and, and like i say we've got loads of pictures but before we get to the pictures let's just briefly explain what we're going to do today because it is a a garden um a restaurant tour restoration uh, demonstration i don't do this all the time but i just thought we're just throwing ideas out there really so i got the oldest crustiest tools that we could find not mine my neighbors because i didn't have any um but look here we have one of the You've seen this on the, the image of the of the stream. There's a, an old fork. I'm not going to make any fork handle jokes at all. The rest of you can do that. But um, I bust this one out of the um, the, the the fork this morning. Um, unfortunately, whilst doing that, it did um, separate into two pieces. So it's uh, two pieces there at the moment. Um, so I've got to make one of those handles. And we're, it did have, before um, it was broken, a D handle on the top. We're not. We're going to put a T uh, on the top just to make life a little bit easier um, and also one other thing um, I'm going to do two things today so we're also going to repair and make another handle for this one maybe Ben if we could go to a different camera just to get a close-up so this is an old there we are an old uh, garden hand fork and you can see we have retrieved the handle for this one but it's seen better days that one's not really going to do much else so nice easy job this one just pre prepare it or repairing or creating a new handle for this one and i got a nice piece of oak to do that with we're glue it in with some epoxy then it should be good to go again for a few more years so yeah that's later on so let's have a look at uh, where i've been getting into trouble for the last weekend and uh oh well, question first before we go any further sorry Colin just a quick one here we've got a question from Paul he's saying hi Colin what was the small detail scraping tool that you used on the central disc of the Viking bowl oh the little one yeah so I just grabbed I didn't even put a handle in it actually which is a bit naughty of me but it was one of the one of these so it was one of the little scrapers that comes with your set for the little micro handles but there we are it's around about a six mil half round now these are available in sets of, sets of six i believe um but just a little round scraper really really handy and then obviously couple that up with the handles um which are available now i think in sets of five or six um you've got uh, a nice little set of multi-tools but that was it it's just a little round nose six mil scraper all right now there are lots and lots of questions um regarding the nick agar uh, sunset bowl i've answered a load this morning so if you sent in a, um, a, a question you'll be receiving an answer very quickly so i've just done a bundle together sent them to someone who's going to then if you remember lily it's going to be lily sending them back out to you so there's loads of questions i'm sure on that one i had loads of fun making that um recording that one because just because i knew i was going to Okay, but uh, yeah. hopefully in terms of the punches the punches are coming we don't have a delivery date yet but they have been ordered so they will be with us okay we all right for the minute okay let's have a look at where i was last weekend i came back yesterday uh left on thursday came back yesterday and um there's, there's a picture of my hotel on the right hand side there the big white building but on the left hand side it's a little square and uh, you can just see um the church there but wonderful um wonderful part of spain this is on the coast uh, like i say the town is um i think he's carrying something there but craig today but wonderful wonderful place and working um so that's me there we've just finished one of the demonstrations i'm uh, halfway through actually and uh, right hand side is uh, my interpreter his name is suso and uh yeah he <laughs> he allowed everybody to understand 
um, my English, and which can be quite difficult sometimes being from the Devon Dorset border. But um, a wonderful group of people, really, really enjoyed that one. And very, very um, healthy wood turning and wood um, carving um, uh, uh, fanatics, I want to say, but um, a wonderful um, uh, country for, for carving as well as, as well as the wood turning. And very 50-50, the mix there. So, yeah, that was, uh, they must have enjoyed it because they've all got their thumbs up. <laughs> painting on these and there's a series of a painted ladies from different countries of the of the world so there's a viking there there's some um, african figures um but i just found the, the decoration really and unusual as well it's, it's sort of something i've never seen i've also brought back a few ideas um sort of thinking of, of ben at the time i very often see different pieces and think of uh, the other straighters presenters here and think well oh, that's something we could do together um and also think about what you guys have suggested as well so there's a little bit decorating and think back last week when i uh, was doing of this style there but what they've done is added other these lovely lovely pendants so well, that was quite good now this was interesting this is a guy pedro and was one of the demonstrators and he um, so this was burnt, so turned, then scorched with a blowtorch, um, and then paints added afterwards. Just pick out that that interesting charring that was created. Reels, this is um, that's like hemp, hemp rope, that sort of. But I had a whole series of these. They're really interesting, real statement pieces, you know. And this one, we are going to do this one because this really struck me. This is a spinning, top, so it's uh, um, it's got a lot of uh, I would say decorating elf and texturing tool. Um, uh, sort of texturing and then a bit of coloring and i thought we could maybe use the chrome craft coloring pens on this It'd be a good little project for us to do uh, we'll, we'll give it a couple of months we'll get to the colder climes and um and have a go at one of those but i think that'd be a nice little toy to have a play with um later on in the year chess sets we were talking about chess sets not long ago someone was suggesting could we do one and this particular um gentleman i've met this guy before um demonstrating out in spain he made the first chess and that was featured in wood turning magazine um but this is a chinese um uh, set a chinese or japanese i can't make out but yeah lots of different uh, uh every single bit's turned i also want to add that um, every single bit's turned, even the the knights, they're really, really uh, well done. But I thought, what what a great little idea, you know, you can make your figures depict whatever culture you want to. And this was a, a really, really interesting one. This, so this was made up in several parts. The wings are separate and some of the um, feathers are separate as well, but individually um, paragraphed afterwards as well. So just to add the detail. Um, and I haven't photographed the whole carving because you'll see around the feet and, and, uh, and, and there's a, some rocks and a little deer um, that uh, looks like he's got a, a, a bit of bad luck going on there, a particularly huge hawk. But um, wonderful detail in that one. It just struck me. I thought you guys would appreciate that with the pyrography as well. Um, this bit of carvings, at first glance, you just think it's a, a horse's head. But then if you look below, you'll see um, the guy fitting uh, a horse shoe to the horse below and the, the front of his horse house horse house um it workshop there all those tools individually hand carved and decorated as well hanging from the the neck of the thing piece with a huge amount of detail in it uh, and what a, you know a great imagination being used there i really like that one in fact that one comes second in one of the competitions that we were lucky enough to be able to judge as well there we are, cannons. We've done some cannons back along, I think, at the end of last year. And I thought, well, this has taken it to the extreme. These are good-sized cannons, probably around about 300 mil, 12 inches uh, long, the gun on those. So they were a good size. Um, and uh, all of those pieces in that picture there are all done by the same person. So uh, that deserves a bit of a show, some good ideas going on. Um, as well as power turning and, and, uh, and hand carving, there was some wet turning and I've never seen a lathe like this. And I've seen pole lathes aplenty in this country, but this was a very old machine. And I don't know whether you can see where the where the lathe is, where there's a, a, a bowl mounted, you'll see like a little ridge section. And that's where he positions the, the tool rest. The tool rest is actually that, uh, that's that curved section, and it just goes along those various notches. What he's doing there, he's just preparing a piece, and you'll see it in a minute. 
um, uh, for a, a pouring jug. Um, and so the, the lathe operates, if you have a look at the, the pole that's coming from behind him, um, pole comes up and then he wraps it around. There's a little spindle behind that bowl. Um, and then he controls that via a treadle underneath. So it's connected then to the treadle that creates the movement. There we are. That's what he was about to prepare. That's not several pieces. They are all the same piece. Um, and he actually turns a half section at a time whilst it's whole, but it doesn't, um, doesn't let, allow the lathe to have a full rotation, obviously, because it'll hit the handle or the spout. So it was really, really good. And then carved afterwards, of course, just to make it a bit harder. <laughs> Here's one of um, Craig's uh, demonstrations. Now, this was, uh, if you look to the left-hand side of the bandsaw there, so the back of the bandsaw, you'll see a cameraman there. That was on local television in Spain, so he made it even to the TV in Spain, in northern Aust uh, northern Spain in Asturias there. But a good group of people. Um, you're wondering where the venue is. It's a sports hall, a local school uh, sports hall, and uh, demonstrations all the way around the outside and the, the actual exhibition up through the middle. Um, TVs and microphones all over the place. And again, Suso there um, uh, being translator for, for Craig as well. Just a few more pieces. So some more pornography and decoration. These are little pen together there. Um, he had that as a single entry in the competition rather than selling any pieces. He just wanted to show, show off the selection. And here we are. I thought this could, uh, this is one for Maria. This one, this is uh, a group of ducks on um, the bowl to represent water um, and cascading down over the uh, the fountain or the the, the the borough there. So that again, that was entered in the competition. Didn't win anything that one, but um, I thought just quite a nice little piece this one, as we're always talking about birds and things. Um, and this is my journey from my hotel to the venue every morning. The the tree, the picture doesn't really give you the full um, scale of that tree. It's about three foot diameter, solid palm. And I thought, wow. It's probably been there for a few years. Of course, I don't want to cut it down, but um, but you can't help look at some of these trees and admire them for what they are. Um, and as you know, I do a lot of palm turning, and that one was a beast of a palm tree, that one. So there we are. That was what I was doing over the weekend. I'm going to have a little bit of a, a, a relaxing weekend while Ben and Jason do make a central, and then I'll be off the following week to Sweden to do a similar type of event, and I'll bring you the pictures for that um, when that's finished the week after. So let's get on to our fork handle. I'll let you all make the jokes. I'm not, because if you're not in uh, the UK, I guess you wouldn't understand the fork handle joke. So I'll leave that to you a lot. And I've, in the description for this um, demonstration, I said it's the time of year to start thinking about getting in the garden. That, of course, is only in the UK. Wherever you are in the world, the summer shifts and the springtime shifts and all those sorts of things. <laughs> You may have been, uh, you may have already been in the garden for a long, long time. What we're going to do is recreate this handle here that I've taken out the big fork. I can just put it back together. Now it's not as straightforward. In this case, it's not as straightforward as as I first thought because I'm oh, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, it's not as straightforward as I uh, first thought because this one actually has this little section that just sort of sort of tilts away, tapers away. So I'll offset the lathe to do that, or I'll, I'll offset the tailstock once we've done the main turning to do that. So to start with, we'll turn nice and straight. And um, I haven't figured out whether it's going to work yet, so I hope it will. Um, but yes, and then we're going to taper down. So big, big section at the bottom, tapering down toward the handle. And what I'll do is I'll go straight into the diameter for um, for the actual T part. I've already drilled that out, by the way. There's, there's the whole... In that piece, that's going to be the handle. So I'm going to drill out to 30 mil, which that is. Um, and then we can slot straight into that. We will then put a little wedge in it. Um, I'll create a slot in the top of here. We'll then put a wedge in, a bit of wood glue to um, secure that handle into place. So that's the shape I want to create-ish. Not for, I've made it a little bit longer. It's a little bit stumpy because there would, would have been a D handle on this side, you see. So I'm going to taper away down to there. If all goes to plan, yes, Ben. Got a bit of a question. So it's good timing with the um, the mention of the D handle there. Uh, we've got sleeping dog, and he's um, he wants to turn a fork handle, and has um, a very similar fork. Um, wants to repair it, and would like to give it back its traditional split D handle. Um, any tips on opening the split, like steam or? 
No, I, I believe, and I've looked at a couple of these because I thought oh, I'll recreate that, but then looking at them, now nah, maybe I won't. I think, I don't think they're steamed. I don't think, I think they're come from a flat plank and it's cut then and then turned, if you know what I mean, before cutting out. I don't think they come from uh, one piece and split open. I can't see how that size um, can be open to that um, degree of radius. I just don't think that works. So I think it comes from a flat plank cut to shape then turned leaving the handle size and then your round piece to put in the top of the handle i believe that must be the way it's done i haven't researched it because uh because i'm going to do the t handle okay so what i've done there is just taking a measurement correct me if i'm wrong everybody well i'm sure in the chat will correct me if if i'm wrong what i've done is just taking a measurement because don't forget we have to um, put this into this section okay of our of our fork so i need to have the right diameter to go into this despite the fact we are going to taper down at the end so i think i've been talking long enough i think we need to get on with some turning so let's get this rough down to a cylinder first so lay speed to zero turn the lathe on uh, rough and gouge all the way i'm not going to bother skewing this trouble with a piece this long <coughs> unless you have a steady a skew will cause you more problems you'll get a lot of um, a lot of vibration in there you'll get a lot of um um little mini cat not catches so much but chips that'll come out and you'll find that you'll actually get on better with this sort of length with a roughing gouge with a small cut show you what i mean in a minute now i've made sure this is absolutely secure and we're turning there at 1400 revs so let's go for our roughing gouge little and often here i'm not going to take big cuts yet By the way, the timber we're using is ash, quite traditional for handles, ash or hickory. Um, There we are. Just taking the worst away. Now I can move the tool rest over. Go to the next section. This has not been cut accurately at all. So, but it's, it's much bigger in diameter than I need also. So it doesn't matter. There we are, almost there, almost down to that round. So let's just do that last little bit. Don't worry about this. This is going to be tapered down in a minute, so that's going to disappear anyway. Just have a double-check tailstock. Keep everything nice and tight. Let's start by making the 30 mil diameter to suit our tenon. So we can do that first. So it's got to fit through there. That's going to be the handle in a moment. So if we can get that length in, in terms of 30 mil. So if I, I'll make it a little bit oversized and we can always cut it off a little bit. So there we are. So beading and parting tool, six mil ish. Thirty mil. So what's that? Inch and a quarter ish. And I'm not gonna worry at all if it's a little bit sloppy. Sounds bad, but we're gonna 
use that wedge to good effect and really expand it into the hole. Now just take out those little bits. You can do that with a roughing gouge if you want to, or just what I'm doing here and go back to the feeding and parting tool. Um, I am going to check this. Don't think I'm just guessing or hoping. Oh, I am hoping, but we'll just do a double check in a moment. There we are. Right, let's just stop everything. We'll just double check, make sure that's going to fit in that hole. 30 mil, remember? Oh, we're way off at the moment. Yes, Ben. No, no questions? Just stretching. <laughs> a little bit more. Let's take a little bit off the front once we got that fitting. Then I'll adjust the I'll adjust calipers a little bit more. I was well undersized the first time. Oh now we're not in centre. Right, that's got to be it now. Just, just there. So that's good. We do everything to that diameter now. We should be on track. So I'll readjust these. Get them fitting and go again. Good. One last double check. Fingers crossed. I want that to slide in nicely. Oh, that's perfect. Sliding in nicely. And what we're going to do then is put the, the little um, cutout in the top. We'll shove that wedge in and uh, we'll have our fork handle. Right, so that's one thing out of the way. Not to worry about that anymore. Next thing, let's start thinking about the taper. So go back to this end. By the way, this hard edge here will not stay. I'm going to taper that in gently to that bit. Yes, Ben. So a uh, question from Paul here, Cohen. Um, how do you keep a long spindle um, concentric, a, a concentric diameter if your tool rest does not go the full length of the workpiece? So it's measure. Do what I'm doing here, measure, measure, measure. Um, calipers, so do several measurements all the way along, join the dots, as it were, and keep going with that. That's the only way. Um, even this one, I mean, this 14-inch tool rest, it's still not going to span this. You can get double um, double stem tool rests if you're doing a lot in production, for instance, but that would be the only way, just measure everything. 
And then Brummy Doug's asking, um, do you ever go up to the local Axminster or his local Axminster in Nuneaton? Nuneaton. I love the name, Brummy Doug. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. We've obviously we've had a, t- a two year break from all that sort of stuff, but that's all back now. Um, we are, well, I'm hoping certainly personally to do a, a mini tour at some point in the near future. Um, and yeah, no, we definitely do. That'll all be advertised when, when either of us, um, end up going there, but yeah, yeah. Done it many times in the past. All right. Let's take this down in diameter a little. Let's just see where we are with that a minute. I'm going to do another little little mark to get my 30 mil, and then we can shape everything or size everything to that. Let me just double check. I tend to check, check, and double check to make sure everything stays right. Yeah, that's right. There we are. That's where we need to be. So here we are, Doug. This is what, not Doug, who asked the question before. So just about keeping the same diameter all the way along. This is what we're doing. Let's do one more at the end here, even though this will be tapered. And this is the important bit. This is the bit that's going into the fork itself. So let me just give myself an idea of length. Let's say to there at least. And from there, we'll taper down gently into this area. So let's go take that down to our marks. about that just a nice gentle cut now with the roughing gouge that's good and then we're going to move along do this little piece just blending into the handle and then we'll do that offset which i think will work Now, remember I said about not using the skew. So what I'm going to do is just nice, gentle, slow moving, as in my movement, slow moving cut along the surface. The reason I say that, if you're slow, your movements across the piece are nice and slow. You've got more revolutions over the turning tool. So you do get a much better finish. All right, let's just stop the lay. Then we'll have a look before we do the other shaping. But I think we're good. We are. We're good. Right then. So the taper on the end. I did scratch my head a little bit of this one. I thought I don't want to mess around with spoke shaves and stuff like that. You might have to. I'm not sure. But look, there's the taper. So I'm figuring out if we offset this a couple of times, we should be there. Yes, Ben. Um, so, question from Frederick. Um, 
He's asking, uh, what finish would you recommend for a wooden garden tools? Um, so, yeah, well, well, that was one of the things we were going to look at, actually. Um, I would, a lot of my tools aren't, don't have a finish on at all, but finishing oil would be good, UV oil. Um, but I have uh, listed one of my favorites. It's the... Um, it's the um, Osmo, that's it, Osmo oil, garden furniture oil, Osmo oil, UV protection oil, those sorts of things. If you want to put a hard wearing like yacht varnish on them, absolutely to try and seal the timber. But if you do that, you've got to do it before you stick it together. So all over to create a complete lack of seal. Um, but, you know, they sometimes they're left out in the rain. Um, I think that one may have been left out in the rain a little bit too long. But, uh, you know, if it's just if it's the right timber, just left as it is, is fine. And then Peter's asking, um, for longer spindle turning like uh, like this, would you expect traditional tools to um, to cause the workpiece to vibrate less and not require as much support compared to using carbide tools? Absolutely. Absolutely. Carbide tools will create a lot of vibration. Um, it's just the way they work. Um, I want support from a bevel. I, w I much prefer that. Support from a bevel then means that it's supporting the timber literally while you cut it. Carbide tools, it's just a cutting edge that's making contact. Nothing stopping them from bouncing away in anywhere at all. So, yeah, for me, um, traditional stuff all of the way. Um, however, um, carbide tools have been good because what they do is they get people that don't have ability – to have someone close to them um, to be able to teach. And that can be an issue. If you're really struggling with a skew chisel, for instance, and I know a lot of people have, um, and there's no one that they can go to for um, tuition and things like that, then a carbide tool will get them going. It will do the projects that they want for, you know, want to, 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 do, to do. So there is a, a, a lot of good reasons to use carbide, um, just not my preference. My preference, all my training, seeing this, and this is—I'm just—I I want to see if it works. I have no idea. I've got to sort of guess it will, and I'm going to take out the un the uneven side. It's got to work, Ben, isn't it? Gonna... Yeah, it look like it'll work. I don't know. Nice and tight. I'm using the ring center here. Um, if single point center, I'd be a bit twitchy with. Um, you know, I wouldn't be sure whether it'd be strong. I'm not sure whether it'd be strong enough. Um, so ring center just gives me a little bit more confidence. I'm just going to be gentle. Just go a bit faster than that. Right, I'm just going to stop. We haven't finished yet, but I just want to stop and see if it's doing what I want it to. Yes, it is. Happy with that. Um, it's going where I want it to. So there's my pencil line, so I can see clearly where we're going to taper to. So if I can see where is the one that's already been done here, I'm going to replicate that sort of shape really. So the only thing it's not going to do for me is give me these side angles. We may have to do another little bit of turning as well. I'll keep that end in. I won't go any, any smaller with that. Um, and I'll offset it just on that end. We'll make a false edge. So let's get my spindle gouge going as well. I'll show you what I mean by that in two seconds. So let's try and start cleaning things up.
Okay, so once I've done this, I'm going to just offset it the other way. Be gentle. Take a little bit off of this side. Think you know what's coming we're going to do the same on the other bit as well i think i am going to have to do a little bit of hand shape in there back to the other side Just using the the bevel of the tool, just like a hand plane, really, just to clean things. Bevel rubbing and that, um, the entry for the the cutting edge, just a little bit more, a little bit more space. There we are. So let's think about sanding. Still a little bit offset, but that's okay. So I think we're almost there. If we compare those two together, we've got a very similar shape. There's the best view. All right. I'll bring it up close to the camera in a minute just to get us in. Um, and I'm going to leave that like that. We'll cut this off and just trim it up with a skew or something in a moment. But let's do a little bit of sanding, and then we'll get this one um, in position and double-checked. But I'm pretty sure, in terms of size, that's going to lock into there quite nicely. Yeah, like that. Like that. Just going to make it a little bit thinner. I haven't got a huge amount of strength left now, so I don't want to mess around with it too much. Okay, sanding time. That's working quite nicely, actually, that second cut. Let me just go over that a bit more. Right, dust extraction on. Now, I'm going to go over this with 100 grit um, and probably only go as far as 150, but it's entirely up to you what you do. You can go as far as you want to. Um, I'm going to include this area as well in my sanding because I want to try and blend it in as much as possible. So dust extraction on. When you're doing this sort of thing, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from stopping the lathe 
just do a bit of hand sanding up the length of the grain. You'll find it really, really helps. Remember where the grain's running to. There we are. Now go down to one fifty. There we are. I think that'll do. Don't want to see me doing too much sanding. My only little niggle is I just want to make sure before I actually part this thing off that it's going to fit in where I want it to fit. I think it will. It's a little bit thick there, but, you know, once I've taken this off, I can just do a little bit of spoke shave work. Um, it's not been unheard of to me get the spoke shave out every now and again. Um, but there we are. I think we'll, we'll rather than um, turn that off, I think we're going to do a little bit of carving with my carving chisel here and then just cut it off. Take a little bit of that cheek away. Then we'll cut it off and, um, and sand it in. I'm happy with that. My fingers out of the way. Right, that'll do us. Let's cut that one off. We can sand it in on the, the old disc sander. I'm not going to go to a band saw to do this. That's us done. Okay, so there's the handle so far. I think we're going to sand a little bit of that away. Which way around does it go? That way. Yeah, so it's just a little bit big on the cheek. Let me... Yeah, I'm going to do a little bit of sanding on that one just to bring them back. Okay, but there we are so far. And then we've got the T-bar to make as well. Yes, Ben? So just a couple of questions here, Colwyn. Um, first one's from Brum Brummy Dog. Uh, Brummy, Brummy Dog. <laughs> I, um, he was like... What was the type of timber? What was the handle? It's from? ash. 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 An ash handle that I've got stuck in here now. No one watched this bit. Yeah, ash or hickory, I tend, I tend to find is your best bet. Ash or hickory, it tends to be tends to be what most of these garden implements are made out of these garden tools. And then so. Grand RP was asking, um, have you ever parted off on, uh, with a saw rather than the parting tool? Not live whilst it's been running, I haven't. No. No, I'm not sure in terms of safety whether that would be advisable, but I've certainly parted off on the lathe without the lathe running with the saw, but not uh, not anything else. 
You just sand that and not have it. That, that, there's a little bit of bulk in the way. So I'll put my just sander on and clean those cheeks off a little bit. There we are, that'll do. If I have to do any more, then I can do that later on. Make sure I'm the right way. That's going in quite nicely now. So by the time we've got, and I'm not going to use rivets. So originally, this was riveted together. I'm going to use... Um, the machine screws, countersunk machine screws. And these top two are really quite thin, this mess material here. So I'm going to re-drill some holes and, and put them in different places and only come in from one side on each. So they're not going to be joined up. Otherwise, I'll have a bolt, um, a, a nut on the other end. So I'm going to come in from both sides just with a separate separate skew, screw. There we are. So let, let's get the top done. So turn... Between sentence again. Yes, Ben, another question. So a question here from Frederick. Um, he has some hornbeam. Would that be okay for a fork handle? Do you know, Frederick, I'm not sure. It's quite a, I know it's a very dense and it's a very hard material, great for uh, mallets and things like that. But I'm not sure you... I, I don't know. I mean, the, way, the reason that hickory and um, ash is used is because it's... It's strong, but it's pliable. So there's giving it. it. It handles um, the stress of being levered. I'm not sure whether the hornbeam might be a bit brittle. So there's no giving hornbeam. Um, so whether it might snap easily, especially after a few years. I might be wrong, but I, I just feel that because it's so dense. Um, I'm not sure it's ideal. Right then, let's go with the handle. Nice, um, nice part of the the project. This is. We'll go with the same centers, um, shall we? Let's go with a small version of a sprung center. So, and here, this is the the little pro center, sixteen mil. Um, so it's not huge. So five eighths ish. I'll use the same center in the tail stop. Already pre-drilled the hole. This is thirty mil. So I know I'm mixing my imperial metric up. But in terms of drill bits, I'll just use what I've got to hand. So that's about an inch and a quarter-ish. We've got another one to do yet, so I'm, I'm running behind. All right, stop messing about. Let's get on with it. Right, so rough and gouge first. We can go right up on speed, of course, now. Down to a cylinder. There we are, almost there. I think just maybe another couple of cuts.
clean up the ends. In fact, let's taper down those ends. I think that'd be quite nice. So if that's my center, if I taper down up, make it make it even. So let's grab a set of dividers a minute and Just so I got this dead right, we'll go there. Just measuring from that center point. And then if I go with the skew chisel just to clean down to our center. That's the right shape. So instead of being dead um, cylindrical, what I've done is just tapered it down more lozenge shape. So we'll sand that up. Let's just clean the ends up first. Yes, Ben. Um, so not really a question, Colwyn, but um, the gentleman would turn us on here, and he said, uh, um, could you tell Colwyn, Stu from Seaton says hello, did a demo at Woodbury Wood Turners the other night, he was there. Excellent. Hello, Stu. <laughs> and sleeping and dogs. hello mark sorry <laughs> and sleeping dogs asking is that going to be the um the colin way signature skew by any chance well uh, well be rude of me to to shamelessly plug all of the time but yes going great guns in uh in spain as well by the way So look, all I've done is I've just swapped this around. So this is a ring center, a live ring center. I've taken the pro drive out because the marks that were left by the live ring center means that I can now swap over to my dry, uh, to my dead ring center and use that as a drive. So I've only got a small amount of material left there whilst I clean away the other side where the pro drive was. There we are. Uh, we'll do a little bit of sanding again. Um, I'll, I'll finish at 150, and then I'll put the disc sander back on. We'll just tidy up those ends, and then we can get that together. Yeah, that's fine. So, disc sander on. And again, you know, normally we will go through the grades. This is this is 120 on here, but then normally again take out this one. We'd put in 
one from the bowl sander just to finish off. I'm not going to mess around. There's a couple more things I want to show you yet. Um, and I can describe that as well as show you. So just sand away those two areas. There we are. Look, that's the worst of that off. What we do now, or what we would normally do, is put the other small sander on and just clean that up to the finish that you're happy with. Like I say, I won't bother today, so I can get the other fork in there for you. So one more thing I've got to do to this to make it work. And we need to just put a little saw cut in, and we're going to put then our wedge in and finish this one off. So let's go. Where am I going to put this saw cut? I want to go against the grain. I'm going to cut down there. Two seconds. Now I'm going to just going to have my back to you whilst I hold this in the bench vise. And make my saw cut. I'm going to use Japanese uh, saw because it's quick and it's a pull cut so I can keep it straight. And they're also good for cutting down the grain. So, I, where was the best view for this one? So, all I've done look, is just cut straight down through. I don't want to come out the bottom. I don't want it to be seen. But that's just enough that the, the wedge can open this up in a second. Yes, Ben. So, a question here from Wieldham Woodturner. Um, would a treated timber like a coir be suitable to make handles for smaller garden gardening tool handles? Yeah. Yeah, I think smaller tools definitely. All of those uh, those exotics um, we would would work. Yeah, and things like dibbers and um, yeah, yeah, anything like that. Um, it's just where there, there's a lot of pressure uh, involved. You know what I mean? There we are. Glue all over the place. So I want to get some glue. I'm going to try and prop this so you can see what's going on here. A little bit of glue down into the slot. I know we had a wedge here somewhere. A sleeping dog's asking, have you cut across the grain or, or with it, or does it matter? So I've cut. If the grain's running, uh, there we are sleeping. That's probably better if I show you them. All right, but look where it's going in com and junction to the handle. I don't want to go to the along the grain with the handle. You see, because that will just split the handle open. Ben, I've put my wedge down. What have I done with my wedge? Oh, got it, got it, got it. Right, so I'm going to line up with my fork, and I'll bring this up for you guys to see in a minute. Just needs some stability. And then where's my little mallet? Don't use a metal hammer. Use a nylon or wooden one. Let's get it part way in, and then I can show you again. So look what we're doing. There we are. So you can see that wedge going in. I just need to create a little bit more to that. As soon as you hear it start to not want to move anymore, then you know that you're about there. Okay, so you can see how far that one's gone in. I'm just going to rush to the bandsaw, quickly to nip that off, because that's too much work for me to do in my 
my pole saw. And I'll be back in literally 10 seconds. Two minutes, two seconds, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. I'm just going to cut that off right through the whole lot because it'll also give a nice look. All right, that's uh, a squeaky band saw. Oh, ben. So that's the, the joy. And all I do with that one is, again, put it back onto the sander and sand that in. So I will quickly do that for you, actually, which is going to mean removing all of this stuff from the lathe because I need to get rid of the tail stop. be back down to zero a minute move all those bits dust extraction on of course little bit more playing around with that and that going to be done but let me just show you that joint again that's what we we're aiming for that glue is going to set that wedge has really jammed it in there and hopefully by the time i've screwed that back together we should have a handle back on our fork you can see all i need to do there now is just screw that back in we've got our nice join so yeah, let's just pop that one down in front of the lathe for a minute. It'll dig a few more spuds. A few more potatoes worth out of that one. I'll pop them there. We'll have a look at that in a minute. I want one more. Got one more to do for you, but this one's going to be super quick because it's only a tiny little fork. But there's a lot of work holding to go over in this. Or useful work holding solutions. So this is pretty much all done between centers. So if you don't have a chuck, it doesn't matter. You can still do something like this. Just hand sand it instead at the end. So my first job is going to be to drill a hole in the blank. I could have kept those, I could have kept those jaws on if I wanted to really. Um, but I'll put these on. I find these a little bit nicer for drilling. Just because they close down to such a small amount, you know. Um, and what I'm going to do to size, or to give me an idea of how long I want to go in, I'm going to just look at the, the handle that I've already got and the tang of the fork that we're going to uh, use. Shall I come in a little bit closer, Ben, do you reckon? Yeah? With this one, just we'll come back to that... Uh, there we are. That's just a little bit. All right. So, yeah, you can see a little bit better there. So I'm going to go into the depth that's already been created on that old handle. Okay. So about there. That's the depth I'm going to drill in. I've already made a hole. Okay, so this hole to replicate this one. That's just to put that bit of leather through. And now we do need the tail stock back. We're going to drill first and then just have fun turning a shape for the handle. And that can be you know, entirely up to you, your design. You can replicate what's already been there. You can do your own thing. Remember, we all have different size hands. 
So doing a big chunky handle, not always going to work for everybody. Okay, so make it suit you if you're the maker or whoever you're going to give it to at least. There we go. You can drill on the lathe. You're going to use your hand to hold. You can at least use the tailstock to support as well. Sorry, the tool rest to support as well. If I bring that up to that point, that will stop it spinning. Okay, if we come up, let's just hold it between those two points a minute. Okay, make sure that I'm drilling the right end. I don't want to drill the wrong end. If I bring that up. There we go. That's going to help me stop that drill bit from twisting that piece. I'm going to turn my light on so I can center up as well. There we are. So now we can carry on going. Let's turn the speed a little bit. There we are. So all that tool, that, that tool rest was doing is just lying the flat of the piece of timber and stopping it from spinning in your hand which is a real risk if you don't have anything like that supporting. So just a neat little trick there that I picked up along the way. That can come away. Now, the the actual uh, fork itself has this little flat area here, so it's just a little spline that is going to grip when we put the whole thing together. It's going to take a little bit of pressure, obviously, because um, it fits in there under pressure. So it's the fun bit. Now we can start turning. We can start playing with the shape. So you've got um, a choice here of how to drive. I'm going to use single pointed center. Yeah, that just fits in there. Your other alternative, let's get that one instead. There's, there's a good alternative. So I'm going to come right in close, Ben. Just come back to this. There we are. I'm going to bring everybody right in so they can see what's going to go on here. Don't really usually like doing this halfway through. It makes everyone feel sick, but there we go. I'm going to stick with the ring center and the tail stop. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to add a fair bit of pressure on this end. And if I start putting that pressure on with a single point center, I'm likely to split the piece of timber. The reason I need pressure is because I'm using a friction drive. Okay, this is the friction drive. This is a light pull friction drive. Um, and friction needs a bit of pressure. If it gets slack in any way, then it will stop. Or well, the piece will stop on it. Now, I'm going to turn at speed here. So probably around about 2,000. There we are. And we'll start by roughing down. Roughing down to the size we want. I have a little brass ferrule that I want to put on the piece. Okay, that's really just for leverage more than anything. When you start levering with the foot, you don't want uh, the end to split. So I'm going to add this piece. Ben, you got a question there? Yeah, we've got a question from Cliff. He's saying um, both the forks look uh, like they could do with the rust being removed um, before fitting new handles. Uh, what would you recommend to do that? Angle grinder. Angle grinder and a web rack's wheel. So like a Scotch Bright wheel we're on the on angle grinder and um, you'll get to that quite nicely. And then a little just a little bit of finishing oil on them. And that really brings out um, the 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 old um, patina finishing oil or your regular wood wax. OK, so wipe your rag in. Get Make, make sure you've got enough to do the job on your rag because you don't want to keep putting rust back in the tin. Um, and then wipe it on all over. But yeah, the first use in a wet day, it's going to go. But at least once you've done it for the first time, it's all there. I mean, you could add things, hammerites and all those sorts of things to it as well. There's um, crust, which I think is a, a rust removal um, thing. But I wouldn't worry too much. They're a working tool. Um, take off the worst with a bit of the, the hammerite disc. 
um, Hammerite disc, Webrax disc, Scotch Bright disc, that sort of thing. Um, and then just a bit of oil, a bit of wax. There we are. So I'm just going to put a little tenon on that with the beading and parting tool. Let's mark the length. Actually, I haven't done that yet. Before we go any further, let's just give that a little test. And I'm just looking at the ferrule. I want to, I want that to. Go. Yeah, that will go on nicely. That will go on nicely. I just need a little bit more, probably a, not even a millimetre, not even half a millimetre off of that. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take that off and put the ferrule on, turn down to the ferrule. Because what I don't want to be guessing is where that ferrule starts and stops. So I actually want to go down to the same diameter. So I can permanently fix that on now. I still got to go a little bit further. better there we are so look, now what i can do is turn down to that feral diameter um and we'll be good So a little bit too thick at the moment, so just take some diameter off. And then rounding over right down to that that ferrule. And I have no guess for it then, you see. I can go straight to it. Look at that. 
you know what, because we can, we may as well put a couple of V cuts in. I'm not used to turning it this time. It's usually siesta. Usually eating. <laughs> right, a little bit of sanding, a little bit of dust extraction. Go to 150 again. Put some oil on. The first one that springs the hand is food safe oil, but finishing oil, UV oil, all of those sorts of things, really. Um, and the only reason I want to do this for is because it's going to look nice. Um, but again, you really don't have to. tools. Friction drop doing itself, doing its job well. There we are. I'm going to glue this in for you because I want to present this tonight. That's going to go on there nicely. So I'm going to put glue in first before I start tapping. Yes, Ben, whilst I'm gluing. Um, so we've got a question here from from Colin. Um, would you re recommend putting the two little indentations in the brass ferrules, or will it be tight enough as it is? No, again, normally I'd glue this, Colin. Um, but you know, if you look at that, this particular ferrule, if it focuses. There we are. Those particular ferrule do have those little indentations, and so they they strike their mark. You can see it there as it goes through. Um, so that stops the twisting action. Um, but a little bit of this, the same glue that I'm going to use now. So this is the Z the Z epoxy, which is an eco, uh, an epoxy resin glue. Um, I just find it the hardest glue. It's really, really tough stuff when it's set. And it puts up with vibration as well. So I tend to use it on pens if I'm doing a pen uh, where I find that the super glues tend to be a little bit they're, they're good and strong um, until you get in any sort of bend in them at all. So with this this little fork being levered around all the time, just find this is going to work better. And I'm going to shove a little bit of that in the end, drive it down with the, with the fork. You can clean this off afterwards if you want, if you get any spillage, clean it away. Sorry, am I I'm not in the right place there? Right, there's plenty in there. Just be careful, you know. I'm going to do that. And so, again, it's going to strike its own lines. I haven't taken off the wooden bit on the back yet, so don't think I'm 
damage in the handle. All the lathe in that fact. Sealing the wood with a little bit of that epoxy. There we are. My next job would be to sand the sand that little nib away on the disc sander that I've just shown you. All right, but there we are. A couple of almost, almost a couple of restored forks. Um, I'm sure my neighbour be really, really happy once um, once I finish these and let them have them back. So there we are. I hope that uh, that's interest you. Have we got any more questions before I disappear? A very rapid uh, exit because we ran way over time. So I really apologise for that, everybody. Um, Fuller's asking if the ram on the tailstock could um, push it together. Um, if it was in line, Fuller, but this one's because of the kink. I'm, I would, I would struggle. That was the only thing. But that works nicely. Or a little bit of scrap wood. If you're worried about the bed of the lathe, that sort of thing. Um, but it's just not in line enough for me to to do that. I would worry about bending the fork itself. All right, we're good. There we are. Me telling me uh, my holiday story, showing him my holiday snaps. Sorry, work uh, snaps. And uh, and then a little bit of restoration of our lovely garden tools. Um, so I'm sure they're going to get another 20 or so years out of those. So thanks ever so much, everybody. Um, tomorrow we've got Ben back. Ben back uh, demonstrating. Um, and then we've got something also exciting to show you on Thursday as well. And then it's Maker Central, of course. So if you're around the Birmingham area, if you fancy going to um, uh, Maker Central, uh, we've been several times for a really, really good show. Um, so I'd encourage you if you can. Um, it's uh, predominantly um, YouTube and makers. That's what it's all about and streaming and things like that. So there's going to be lots of your YouTube faves there. People like Jimmy Darista and um, April Wilkerson and all those sorts of guys. So yeah, it's it's a good event. That's on fr uh, Saturday, Sunday this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Ben's nodding his head. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, subscribe, um, give us a thumbs up, and uh, and share with as many people as you can. I will see you next week. Um, I'll be behind the scenes on Thursday doing all the flickery um, that Ben's been doing today. So thanks again, everybody, and see you next week. Bye-bye.